Okay, thank you very much for this very uh, nice introduction, typical time at the University College. When I was asked whether uh, I would give the patent lecture, I didn't hesitate a minute or a second for several reasons. One of them is shown in my first slide. Uh, it turns out that my hometown, Lindau, uh, is a place where a very famous, where two very famous Irish monks civilized the Alemanni. I'm an Alemanni. And uh, at around between 600 and 700, when the Alemanni were usually busy with hitting at each other, uh, these monks came along, founded monasteries, and made this place into a very livable uh, area. Now, Columban was the elder one on his third journey. Uh, didn't take the way through France, but he took a ship uh, and then walked. I think they walked at the time. Didn't think they have, uh, had horses. This, uh, through this, um, uh, in this pathway, and you can see he stayed at Constance, founded Reichenau. He also founded uh, St. Gallen with his uh, uh, chum, Gallus. Unfortunately, they, they uh, didn't get along very well because it turned out that St. Gallus could speak uh, German, whereas um, Columbanus couldn't, and uh, St. Gallus was much more uh, successful. And this somehow... Uh, made it difficult for Columbanus. He, he went on uh, via the Alps to end up in, uh, in the monastery of, of Bobbio. So uh, when I heard that I'm, I have the opportunity to come to Dublin, I immediately dawned upon me that I would like to have, uh, find out whether there are some uh, indices, uh, uh, some handwritten scripts for which the uh, <coughs> Irish are very famous, but it turned out that all the manuscripts, including those written by Columbanus, uh, had been gone. So uh, in this respect, this was a bit of a, a disappointment, but uh, I'll try nevertheless to find out where his descrip the description of his, his journey and the mentioning of the Lake of Constance, where I can find that. The other... Uh, reason why I like to come here is the Physiological Society. Uh, I have been sort of civil, uh, scientifically civilized in England at the University College uh, London, and the Journal of Physiology was always uh, our, the journal to publish in. It's very different for the youngsters to publish in one of the tabloids like nature or science, was not taken serious if there was not a follow-up paper in the Journal of Physiology. This has, sadly enough, changed, but this was uh, the common practice at the time. And I did a, a, a bit of a review. Most of my work of my, uh, that I take serious is published in the Journal of Physiology. <clears throat> now, what I'm going to do uh, today is to talk about uh, discoveries that relate to signaling in single cells and between cells in vitro. Then I will give you a brief overview of single columns, cortical columns, that is in vivo. And finally, uh, I will give you uh, an overview of uh, what we have been doing about cortical networks. The aim of all this is to find out whether these discoveries that we made during the 90s in brain slices are, so to speak, implemented in vivo. And this has kept me busy for the last uh, 20 years. Turned out much more difficult, but as the te techniques develop, um, one can uh, find out whether what we have observed in uh, 
a slice, a brain slice, is indeed implemented in the working brain and more, more importantly, what is the function of these mechanisms. <coughs> First, a brief description of the method. The work on in, in vitro is all done on brain slices taken from the rodent whisker system. Uh, the, a whisker, when it is deflected, signals uh, towards the uh, trigeminal nucle nucleus. There it is related to thalamus and from the thalamus into an area which is called the vibrissal cortex. Now, in order to study the cells in the vibrissal cortex, there are two kinds of slices. One cuts a slice either along these rows of columns and ends up with a slice like this. This is called a thalamocortical slice. Or more conveniently, one takes a parasagittal slice. This is shown schematically here, where there is a, uh, where the individual columns are preserved only partially. However, it has a number of advantages uh, for recordings that are not aimed uh, to explain the exact topology of a particular cell. Now, <clears throat> uh, Fred Sigvers said in the 90s that patch pipettes are more useful than initially thought. And this is true because uh, all the work I'm going to talk about uh, is done in the what's called the whole cell recording configuration from neurons of a brain slice in a dish. So we cut these slices, that you have seen the last slide, put it in an experimental chamber, and use uh, patch pipettes to make contact with the surface membrane of, of, a, of a neuron. We uh, remove the patch of membrane that is uh, sucked into the tip of the pipette and then have low resistance and uh, have low resistance access to the cell in, uh, to the cell interior which is perfect for round cells if you want to clamp it that is measure currents however since the, the uh, neurons are characterized by these processes uh, the only useful configuration of recording from a cell in a dish is what's what we call volt, whole cell voltage recording. So it is uh, a substitute for intercellular recording with the uh, additional advantage that we can rather quickly equilibrate the, cell, the cell's interior with the pipette solution. How is this done? That's shown in the right part of this slide. That's the tip of a patch pipette. One applies a pressure on the uh, back of the pipette. This sort of cleans away the, uh, the uh, axons and the glia, then touches the membrane, uh, removes the suction, and in many cases immediately a patch of membrane with a high uh, seal resistance is sucked into the patch into the tip, and then applying a, a, a bit of negative pressure gives you complete access or gives you low resi resistance access to the cell with the advantages I mentioned of a low resistance and the possibility to exchange or substitute the cell interior with the pipette solution. <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, how we began. Now, the first thing, when I saw these uh, beautiful cells in slice, I was wondering what is going on in this apical dendrite. There had been some suggestion that it's electrically excitable. The consensus was, however, that, it's a, uh, that it is a passive membrane. It just uh, conveys EPSPs and IPSPs in a slightly attenuated form, depending on the uh, on the, onto the core resistance and the membrane resistance. However, this is not so because we thought, and this is Greg Stewart and myself, that we could check this by, by opening the, the, the cell at two 
uh, sites, namely the soma and at the dendrite. This is an experiment where we, where we filled uh, the pipettes with two fluorescent solutions. You can see there is, uh, from each pipette, there is a uh, uh, inflow of the fluorescent dye into the uh, <clears throat> into this cell. So we can record at two sides of the cell, that is the soma, and at uh, some distance from the soma in the dendrite. Now the first thing we found out is that action potentials that are elicited at the uh, soma by current injection are so-called uh, back propagate into the uh, into the into the dendrite. Is shown here. The action potential. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Is it possible to have a, a bit strong or a stick? Something like that. It's it's really weak. Okay. Good. Uh, too bad. Um, so what you are supposed to see in 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 A is that an X potential is set up by current injection into the uh, soma. It elicits an action potential, which, you can, uh, which then propagates, obviously, into the, uh, into, into the axon, axonal arbor. But, danke, thank you. But at the same time, recording with the green pipette, you can see that it back propagates, attenuated into the dendritic uh, into the apical dendrite. Now we have done this also for natural stimulation. Here um, the apical dendrite was stimulated extracellularly. It caused an action potential recorded with a blue pipette, which then back propagated into the dendrite. So even with, uh, with normal or with uh, synaptic stimulation, these uh, uh, action potentials that are elicited by the EPSP back propagate into the uh, uh, axonal arbor. You can see that the EPSP is recorded first, followed by the somatic, uh, followed by the recording of the somatic pipette. However, the action potential is delayed with respect to the action potential recorded in the, in the soma. Now, by looking at the latencies and the uh, relative latencies, of the setting up of an action potential for various distances along the, uh, along the uh, uh, dendrite showed that um, the, the uh, uh, action potential back propagation is rather fast. If I remember co correctly, it's one, uh, one millimeter per second. So it's much slower than the axonal, but it back propagates actively into the uh, in, into the uh, dendrite and, <coughs> and causes depolarization and as you will see later on also uh, calcium inflow into the dendrite. So to summarize, using dual whole cell recording from a single neuron have shown that the dendrite is not a passive structure. It is an active structure that uh, produces action potentials that are initiated in the axon initial segment. I'm not going to show the evidence, but it's published. Uh, and then this action potential propagates forward into the axonal arbor, but also backward. So whenever an action potential is initiated in a cell, both ends of the cell, that is the dendrite and the axon, are, uh, are subject to a brief depolarization. It is as if both ends, the receiving end and the, uh, uh, and, and the um, <coughs> sending end, are informed uh, that an action potential uh, has occurred at the soma, actually the axon initial segment. Now, this is all very nice, but what might be the function of this? Now, this is work with, uh, done with Matthew Larkum. Here we, we, uh, you see an experiment where, again, we are recording with, in this case, three pipettes from the soma from what's called the layer four domain 
of these, uh, uh, of these dendrites and from, the ap and from the apical dendrite. Now, in this part of the slide, you see that stimulating the soma with current injection generates an action potential, which obviously is traveling back. You can see it's first uh, recorded with the green and then with the, with the uh, uh, red pipette. If, however, we combine this action potential with current injection into the apical dendrite, we find that, this, uh, that the frequency of action potentials is tripled. So all we did is use uh, current injection into the soma and combine it with a uh, current injection that has a shape of an EPSP or creates the shape of an EPSP. And we get, uh, instead of one action potential, we get three action potential. We've called this uh, coincidence, the capability of this cell for co coincidence detection. To make this a bit more lively, I have a, I'm going to show this, how this has happened, how this is happening, because it turns out that this is a very time sensitive process. So what you're going to see is the current injection into the soma, which creates an, uh, initiates an action potential, and this remains constant. Now we uh, inject the current via the apical input at different times with respect to the current injection at the soma. So you will see this EPSP-like potential wander uh, in this direction, and you will see that at, for, for a certain distance between the input to the basal unit, to the basal input and the apical input, there is a tripling of action potentials, which then subsides when the distance between the two current injections is too large. So now watch. Action potential, action potential, action potential. Now doubling, tripling. So what is happening is the dendrite, because of its electrical excitability, can act as a coincidence detector for inputs arriving at the basal input and uh, at the basal dendrites and at the apical dendrites. And this is sensitive, very time sensitive. This uh, effect uh, is seen within about 50 milliseconds. So we have a, a device, these layer 5 neurons are, are devised to sense coincident input to different parts of their uh, apical dendrite. <coughs> now, we have been working, uh, and this is published in the Journal of Physiology, that's the full paper. This is uh, what you saw here is uh, published in the tabloid, um, happens to be nature, and this is the proper, uh, 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 proper uh, uh, publication in the Journal of Physiology. Now, I don't want to go into the details. What we found out is there are three potential uh, initiation sites, which we call A, B, and C, and by combining inputs into different combinations, for example, C and B, one can uh, elicit bursts of action potential. So what you see here is a current injection into uh, C, causes a single action potential. If it's combined with B input, uh, with a subthreshold B input, then uh, the number of action potential is tripled. So what this means, it's not only a time-sensitive device, this dendrite, but it's also sensitive to the location of the inputs. So to summarize it, the layer 5 pyramidal neuron has two important properties based on backpropagating action potentials. One is that it's time sensitive to uh, inputs arriving in different parts of the dendritic, uh, of, the, of the dendrite. And second, it also senses the location of these, uh, of these inputs by generating different action potential patterns. <clears throat> now, so this was the second uh, discovery we, we made, that is backpropagating action potential, and as a consequence of this, the 
uh, capability of the layer 5 B cell to detect uh, coincident input. The third discovery we made in slices is shown here by a result of a triple recording. We are recording from three cells. One is a driver cell, it's a pyramidal neuron, and these are two inhibitory cells. And if we elicit action potentials in this driving cell, uh, we find that uh, the target cells display what is called short-term plasticity, that is, the size of the EPSP either increases or decreases. Now, the exciting thing, uh, what, what I thought is, or what I thought is the exciting thing, that this is target cell specific. So we inject a, a current or illicit action potentials, um, in this case of about 10 hertz, I think. Um, wait a second. Uh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> and record from the two target cells. And in one target cell, you find what is called facilitation. In the other target cell, you find depression. So the effect of trans on transmission of an uh, action potential burst depends on the target cell. Actually, this is not our discovery. It was seen in an insect muscle uh, uh, a few years before, but it's, uh, uh, I wasn't aware of it, but um, the, the original discovery of target cell-specific uh, short-term uh, plasticity was made in an, in an insect nervous system. Uh, <clears throat> so then we tried to see whether this is true for connections between excitatory cells. These are connections between an excitatory and inhibitory cell. We couldn't find any sign of target cell specificity. Um, and found that in cortex, there is no such uh, rule or there is no consistent picture of target cell specificity. However, when we compare the short-term plasticity in, the cort in a cortical synapse with the short-term plasticity in a thalamus, we see the same difference, or we see a large difference. In this connection of the same cell, cell type, I have to say, uh, there is facilitation, and in the uh, subcortical cell, there is depression. You can see this by these rising EPSPs, uh, and here by this uh, decrease in the size of the EPSCs. So that's the third um, discovery we made in um, slices. And the fourth one, I'll sh show only briefly, uh, is what is called spike timing dependent plasticity. Since we could record from several cells, I was wondering what is happening if uh, an action potential generated, let's say, in the red cell and making a synapse with a blue cell is combined with a backpropagating action potential in the blue cell, asking the question, if you have action potentials of neighboring cells, in one cell it is uh, traveling, or if we look at the uh, effect in the dendrite, in the other cell we look at the effect on, on, in the axon, and what we find is that depending again on the time window, there is a increase in synaptic coupling or a decrease in synaptic coupling, which critically depends on the occurrence of these action potential bursts. This is shown here for one experiment where you see the data, the control data, then EPSPs and action potentials are paired for uh, five minutes, something like that, um, and as a consequence, you see a permanent, or let's say, a, 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 an increase in the EPSP size that lasts about one hour before the preparation usually uh, deteriorates. So, <clears throat> to summarize, what we have found using recording in slices from 
with multiple patch by patch is A, the demonstration that the, uh, uh, that the apical dendrite is electrically excitable, B, that due to this electrical excitability, these cells are endowed with a coincidence detection capability for uh, inputs arriving within a short time window and arriving in different parts of the, um, <clears throat> of the apical uh, dendrite. We also showed that uh, the uh, transmission of these cells to their target cells depends on the um, type of the target cell. And this is revealed only if you look at, action, at uh, bursts of action potentials. And finally, by combining pre- and post-synaptic action potentials or bursts of action potentials, uh, we can permanent or we see a permanent uh, change in the strength of the coupling between these cells. By the way, this is an example of a reciprocally uh, coupled cell and one can very nicely demonstrate that coincident activity increases the coupling in one cell that is red to blue or and decreases the coupling blue to red. So if there is coincident activity depending or initiated by action potential bursts, um, <clears throat> this will change the coupling between these cells. The common denominator of all this is the occurrence of action potential bursts. We, have, we, can discover, we have discovered these phenomena only when we initiate bursts in the pre and the postsynaptic uh, cell. So action potential bursts are uh, a, a, an, a, an important feature of uh, signaling in the central nervous system in the dish. In the next 10 years, I spent to find out whether this is, this is also so in uh, uh, an intact brain. And this has kept me busy uh, until to now. We, haven't, we have got a few, uh, most answers, but the most important one I'll show you at the end is still an open uh, question. So before we move to uh, this checking of mechanisms that we have discovered in a slice, well, this is implemented in the, uh, in the uh, <coughs> living brain. I have to give a brief introduction of what is called a cortical column. Because we want to study interaction between cells in their natural environment. And this means recording again with the patch pipette from individual columns in the uh, S1 area of uh, the rodent whisker system. This is shown at different <coughs> magnification. That's an overview. Uh, we um, deflect the whisker and record the uh, EPSPs and action potentials with a patch pipette. Since this is done blindly, and it is essential to find out which type of neuron uh, we were recording from. You'll see that this depends very much on the type of neuron. Um, <laughs> uh, we have to, uh, we fill the cell, cut up the brain, and then reconstruct it and register it into a standard frame. This is shown for this particular cell. It was recorded, it was a layer four spiny stellate cell. Maybe I should first say uh, a column is subdivided in three parts. This is called supragranular, granular, and infragranular. Now we are recording here from an infragranular, from a um, granular cell. Causes, uh, visco deflection causes an X potential plus EPSPs. We fill them and then uh, find out that we have been recording from a sp spiny stellate cell. These are these yellow or ochre cells. Now doing this in a systematic way, we can assemble a database uh, of cells recorded from, that is their geometry and their physiological uh, properties. Uh, <clears throat> and this uh, is an effort that also took a few years because one has to do this cell by cell doing the reconstruction is the most time consuming part, but we are now, as you will see, have a complete picture of such a cortical column in this particular area. <clears throat> I 
Well, the first thing we were asked, or we, are, we were asking is, when you deflect a whisker, how fast is the information conveyed to uh, the different layers of a cell? The cell uh, uh, of, a, of a column. The column is usually subdivided into six layers, um, and each layer is characterized by a particular cell type. They are called layer six, that is a layer, a layer uh, identifier plus an identifier that gives you the shape of the uh, <coughs> dendritic arbor. Now, to our surprise, we found that contrary to the dogma at the time, there is no such thing as a preferential activation of layer four and then a spread of activity into the different layers. This was sort of a dogma. At the time we did the experiment, we had a lot of uh, problem to publish this, even in the Journal of Physiology. But eventually, uh, this was done, and now everybody agrees uh, that this is the case. So the activation of a column is near instantaneously. The reason why we could claim this is shown here. We're recording from a layer 5 B cell upon a whisker deflection, and look at the latency, it's about 8 milliseconds. We look at the layer 3 cells, which is lo located up here, uh, and the latency is exactly the same. So all the latencies um, differ by not more than 1 to 2 uh, milliseconds, indicating that the thalamic input is near simultaneous in, this, uh, in, this, in such a, a, a column. There is no, at least in this system, a major excitation of layer 4, which then distributes the excitation to different layers. <coughs> now, uh, another feature that is important for uh, what I'm going to say uh, later is the construction of receptive fields. Each cell is characterized not by a uh, receptive field by at least two receptive fields, depending on whether you measure the synaptic potentials or whether you uh, measure the action potentials. This is illustrated here, for, again, for a layer 4 cell in the C2 uh, uh, whisker column. This is the, a bar histogram of distribution of PSP amplitudes, and this, this is a distribution of the number of action or the probability of occurrence of action potentials. Now, you can't compare, the obviously, the sizes, but you can compare the width and, and the sharpness of these fields. And what we found is that, without exception, the PSP receptive field is much shallower than the action potential uh, receptive field. And if you want to uh, draw up wiring diagrams, it is not enough just to look at the action potential receptive field, but you have to look at the synaptic uh, receptive field. <clears throat> now, we come closer to uh, what I want to say. This is a, a recording from layer 5. In layer 5, you have two cell types. One is a layer 5A and the other is a layer 5B cell. Uh, <clears throat> Both of them are pyramidal cell. This is called a thin tufted, that's called a thick tufted. And what you can see is that the synaptic input field is much sharper, narrower, in the case of a layer 5A cell, although their, di uh, their distance is only about 100 micrometer at most. So <clears throat> it is really important to discriminate by doing these recordings the type of cells you're recording from. And I will concentrate now on these layer 5 B cells. These are, by the way, the, the cells that we characterized in the in, in, uh, in, in the in vitro situation. Now, they are characterized by a broad receptive field at the input level, meaning that you can elicit a response in this particular cell, not only by deflecting the principal whisker, but also deflecting these surround whiskers, and they give a response which is almost as large as the principal whisker, meaning that the discrimination of this cell for the location of the stimulus is very bad, or 
basically absent. Uh, an observer who would um, uh, you know, listen to the or see the PSPs elicited by different uh, by deflection of different whiskers would not know which whisker was deflected, which is very different in this case. The largest response is always due to the deflection of the principal whisker. Now, these layer 5 cells have not only a broad uh, input receptive field, but also a very broad output receptive field. This is, again, a bar histogram of the probability of responses upon a, a whisker deflection. And you can see the discrimination. This is a principal whisker. These are the surround whiskers. The discrimination is very, uh, is very uh, uh, low. The difference is very low. However, these same cells have the largest action potential output. What you see here is the summed number of action potentials elicited by a whisker deflection for different um, cell types in a column. This would be the supragranular cells. These are the granular cells. And these are the thick tufted infragranular cells. And you can see that layer 5b or layer 5 thick tufted sticks out as that cell type that dominates the output of a uh, column. Another observation that we made, and this relates to the fact that in layer five, in, in these layer uh, five thick tufted cells, we can elicit bursts of action potential is that both in the spontaneous activity as well as in the stimulated activity, that is, we are looking at the action potentials um, and look uh, and, and ask the question how many of them occur as bursts. A burst is defined as a pair of action potentials or a triple of action potentials not, uh, that are separated by less than 10 milliseconds. And you can see that these layer 5 uh, B neurons in the intact uh, cortex have a rather high percentage of these uh, burst-like uh, responses. Doing the same thing, uh, doing the same recording in other cells shows that this is particular to layer 5 B cells. So the layer 5 B cell, uh, thick tufted layer 5 B cell that we characterized in the slice, also in its natural environment, when it's embedded into the uh, network of the, uh, <coughs> the vibrissal cortex is characterized by the occurrence of a high percent, higher percentage of uh, action potential bursts. Now, one question <coughs> we were asking is, what could be the functional significance of the occurrence of bursts in these layer 5b uh, cells. And this becomes obvious if one looks at the downstream target cells of layer 5b cells. These are located in the uh, thalamus. It's called the POM, nucleus of the thalamus. They have surprisingly, as we recently found, also a very nice topology that each, is each whisker is represented by an aggregate of uh, uh, cells that are stained in red or in green, even if you label two columns in the uh, two uh, adjacent columns in the cortex. What this means is that the topology of the whisker pad is maintained in the afferent thalamus, it's maintained in the cortex, and it's also maintained in the downstream targets of, of the cortex. So um, there is a, an atomical labeled line arrangement where a particular whisker activates a particular area in each of these nuclei, and this is maintained up to uh, the POM. However, if one looks at the POM in response to whisker stimulation, one finds a curious phenomenon. Um, Namely, that the size of the EPSP elicited by a whisker deflection depends very strongly on the 
number and, and, uh, and the time of occurrence of spontaneous EPSPs. This is graphed in this uh, form, the normalized EPSP amplitude in response to a viscous stimulation increases as the distance between a spontaneously occurring EPSP and the evoked EPSP gets longer. So for 100 milliseconds distance, you have the full EPSP. At 10 milliseconds, uh, the size of the EPSP is decreased to about 40%. Uh, <clears throat> now, what does this mean for information transfer? It means that uh, in this particular pathway, downstream of layer 5 B cells, uh, the occurrence of bursts makes sure that information is transmitted. This is shown, or we showed this by a simulation, where we simulated uh, uh, the input into a POM cell with different patterns of action potentials recorded from the cortex. And in brief, what we found is that there are two situations where there is a action potential initiated in the POM. One is when uh, the uh, EP, when the action potential is preceded by a long period, long meaning about a second, or more importantly, if there is a burst of action potential, this is shown here, three action potentials in succession will generate uh, a POM uh, action potential. The following EPSP, which is only about 100 milliseconds later, will, will not reach a uh, threshold nor here. So, this synapse, the downstream synapse of uh, layer 5 B cells is characterized by an adaptive gain where the uh, transmission is dependent very much on the occurrence of bursts. So, <clears throat> to summarize, what we have found is that in a slice, there is a particular there are particular ways to, uh, to uh, elicit exponential bursts. And recording from these layer 5b cells in vivo, we find A, that they are uh, occurring in vivo, and B, that apparently one important function is to ensure transmission from the layer 5b cell in the cortex to the uh, 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 thalamic, uh, to the thalamic cell, as I've shown here. So action, the occurrence of action potential bursts is a very important uh, feature in this particular system, beginning at the cortex and uh, continuing into the down downstream targets. Now, the main question, which I have been struggling for many years now, is what could be the input which could be the inputs into layer 5 B cells that generate such bursts. In the slice, it's easy. We just stimulate. In vivo, we first have to reconstruct <coughs> the environment of these layer 5 B cells. So what we did is we reconstructed thalamic neurons in that project into a column. As shown, these are these black uh, uh, black traces, each uh, uh, from about 20 um, thalamic cells superimposed on top of each other. And here you see what we call a dendrite column. This is uh, the cells of a column with their uh, <coughs> dendrites attached and they're colored in different, they are shown in different colors. And the combination of the thalamic afferent and the cortical dendrites we call one building block of the system. It's called the thalamocortical unit. The other, <coughs> the other um, building block is called the IC unit. This is defined by uh, all cells in such a column, but with their axons um, attached. But you can see immediately that the dendritic column is restricted basically to one column as we see it in histological stains. The uh, 
I see on it that is with all the accents uh, attached has a uh, our shaped our shaped uh, uh, has our glass shaped, but it extends its accents into the next and and the in the neighboring and the post neighboring uh, accents. So there is no such thing as a column, if uh, 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 of an isolated column, if one looks at the complete reconstruction of dendrites plus axons, these uh, IC unit, as we call it, comprises about nine columns plus the septa between. These are the outlines of individual columns that uh, we obtain by using histochemical stain. Uh, each of these columns would have a dendritic distribution like this, but you can see that they stretch over several columns. Now, having reconstructed, we can now ask the question, which axons uh, contact layer 5b cells? These are the cells with birth. Uh, just by stripping off all cells out of these two, two units that are not layer 5b cells or uh, uh, <coughs> And, uh, well, and uh, that are not layer 5 B cells. And what you can see here is that the thalamocortical uh, projections superimpose partially with layer 5 B basal dendrites. This is uh, quantified in this, in these two curves. This is a 1D density profile of the VPM projections. And this is a 1D projection, uh, 1D density profile of uh, the uh, of the uh, <clears throat> dendrites. You can see there is a, a substantial overlap between VPM neurons and layer uh, 5B. Now this is all not so impressive uh, because most of the thalamus is really projecting into layer 4. The thing is very different, however, if we look also at the other part of the thalamus, it's called the POM. POM is also projecting into the cortex, where we uh, superimpose onto the dendritic profile the profiles of the POM and of the VPM. And what you can see quite clearly is that for this type of cells, there is a difference in the innovation of the apical dendrites, mostly innovated by POM, and uh, the basal dendrites, which is mostly in, uh, innovated by VPM. So this is one indication that coincident input to these layer 5 B cells could arrive from activation of the two thalamic nuclei, VPN and POM, because VPM excites the lower initiation or the uh, soma closed initiation zone, and this excites the apical initiation zone, uh, as, we, as you have seen this in, in the slice experiment. However, things are even more, more complicated if we look at the cortical-cortical connections. So here you see a superimposition of the axonal arbor of layer 6 cells with the dendrites uh, of layer 5b cells, that is, the cross innovation between these two cell, type, two cell, uh, cell types and with the layer 5 uh, slender tufted. Now, what you can see is if one uh, calculates the 1D density profile, is that for cortical cortical innovation, there is also a division of innovation between layer 6 and layer 5, uh, and layer five thick tufted which mostly innovate the basal dendrites and uh, the layer 5 thin tufted, which mostly innovate the... Uh, okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, which mostly innovate the apical dendrites. So again, as seen with the thalamocortical afferents, where, where uh, axons are innovate mostly the apical, or mostly the basal dendrite, for the cortico-cortical uh, projections, there is also a difference in innovation 
uh, of layer five uh, of the layer five B cells in the apical and in the uh, basal dendrite. What this means is that there are multiple combinations of inputs from both the thalamus and from uh, the cortex, from the uh, uh, IC unit, that could be responsible for coincident input. The question, which we haven't answered, and this is uh, our major question, is which combinations of these inputs are active in an intact animal uh, when coincidence detection is uh, occurring. There are indirect evidences that coincidence detection is indeed seen in the behaving animal. This is due to calcium uh, imaging. However, the source of these two uh, of these inputs is not known. An educated guess that we are following is that one uh, in type of input comes from the thalamus. It activates the basal dendrites. And the other type, uh, uh, the other innovation of the apical dendrite is due to the layer 5A cells. This, this would be the innovation profile by layer 5A cell. However, there are many co uh, combinations of spatially separated inputs that could lead to coincidence detection. Now, <clears throat> to summarize, what we have found is that with respect to the network of this uh, system, there is a very stereotyped input, as if one looks at the action potentials generated in the uh, thalamus, in the afferent thalamus. This is the uh, uh, output map. It's almost a single, single whisker map. It's due mostly to large EPSPs, followed uh, briefly by an IPSP, which produces a very sharp input. Now, this is transmitted to the cortex. The cortex has also a weak EPSP, which is broad. And if you look at the distribution of, EP, uh, of EPSPs, uh, or at the uh, uh, action potential distribution in, this, um, uh, in these cells, you find a very unspecific representation However, as I showed, to you, showed you, the output of these cells is characterized by the occurrence of spikes. About 15% of all spikes are part of a burst of one or two or three or even four action potentials. So layer 5b in the cortex loses the specificity of representation in the VPM, becomes rather unspecific. unspecific. However, the X potential is characterized by a different, or the output is characterized apparently by a different code, um, characterized by the occurrence of bursts. Now, one um, function of these bursts is to overcome synaptic dispersion in the downstream synapse. Uh, this is from a POM cell. I showed you that due to this uh, uh, depression, or this adaptive gain, only uh, EPSPs are elicited of a large, of a size large enough to elicit an action potential when they are not preceded by the ongoing activity. So the ongoing activity in the cortex sort of controls the gain in this particular synapse. And this uh, gain, or, uh, even if this gain is low, it can be overcome by the occurrence of bursts. To summarize this, uh, <clears throat> what you have seen in the previous slide is uh, a VPM module that has a very precise projection. Uh, it projects into a column. The column has a very imprecise projection. And this is due, I don't want to go into this, but it's due to the large axial arbor of the layer six corticocortical cells, which smears out the projection. However, they uh, uh, change the code, the action potential code, to a code that, is, uh, um, that contains bursts. And this uh, action potentials that contain uh, bursts can overcome the ongoing de depression in uh, the POM. So what is happening is apparently a very precise 
representation with a rate code is transformed into a very imprecise uh, representation, however, with a different code, and this code is read preferentially by at least one type of target cells. So what this means is that the, lay that the column or the layer 5 cells in the column are sort of hubs that change the representation uh, by changing their output uh, code. And this is uh, probably true for these other downstream targets. We're just working on these. There's also a very clear representation. We haven't done the physiology, but I suspect that the occurrence of bursts in these, uh, in these layer 5 B cells is also necessary to activate cells in these uh, downstream targets. Now, this is anecdotal. No, it's not anecdotal, but it's not published. Um, what you have seen so far is recordings from the anesthetized animal. We have, however, started a few years ago with Christian de Kock to look at this question of coding uh, in different types of a, uh, of a column when there is active touch. And just to cut or to summarize this, we find that the only type of cell that responds upon active touch are the layer 5 B cells. You see an example of the touch here. This is touching a bar, and this is recorded from a layer 5 B cell. You can very clearly see that there is an increased number of bursts. So the idea that layer 5 B cells change the code and thereby maintain uh, the uh, projection specificity could, be, could indicate that when a principal whisker is uh, touched, there are more bursts than when a surround whisker is touched. So the signature that a particular whisker has been touched is, is uh, sort of coded by, the appearance, by these appearances of uh, bursts. <clears throat> to summarize, then, um, from what I have shown you is that the four, and I didn't tell uh, all the evidence because it would have taken too much time, is that what we have discovered in the slides, namely backpropagating action potential, coincidence detection, target cell, uh, cell specificity, and uh, spike time dependent plasticity, they are all implemented in the in vivo. We have focused here on the occurrence of action potential bursts. And there, the evidence is the weakest that action potential bursts are indeed generated by coincident inputs into the layer 5b cell dendrites. We can, we have evidence, we have indirect evidence, but the uh, decisive evidence of looking at inputs to different inputs into uh, the apical dendrite of layer 5 B cells is still missing. So, missing. so this is all suggestive, but it doesn't prove that the per it, what, what seems to be clear is that coding in the cortex is mostly via bursts, but how these bursts are generated is still not uh, decided. I have shown you a few uh, anatomical uh, reconstructions that suge suggest different combinations that would generate bursts, but it will rely upon a specific, um, a spe a specific activation of different efferents uh, making synapses at different parts of the apical dendrite. So this is still uh, an, open, uh, an open question that we are actively uh, following. But <clears throat> at least potentially, this burst activity in layer 5 B cells could reflect coincident inputs from various sources. I've shown you five different sources, but which are the ones that are actually producing this is not known in the moment. So I just want to uh, give the names of the collaborators. The intra-signaling intra was done by two Australians, 
Greg Stewart and Matthew Larkum, an Indonesian and a South African. This is Henry Markram, Alex Reis. Mar uh, they all have uh, positions now in their respective countries. The Kolim architecture was uh, clarified in collaboration with Michael Brecht, he's in Berlin, Christian de Kock, he's in Amsterdam, Oberländer is in Bonn, and Egger is in uh, California. And the last part that is a subcortical targets was done by Alexander Gros, uh, Rebecca Mies, and uh, Tony Sumser. So uh, this is the end of it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>